very warm welcome at Hyde Park. We will tonight discuss Sri Lanka and the UK relations and how we go forward in terms of investment, trade, tourism. We've invited to our studios at Hyde Park the British High Commissioner to Sri Lanka and the Maldives, His Excellency James Doris. Good evening and a warm welcome. Good evening, Indy. Thank you for inviting me to join you this evening. We're indeed uh, pleased to have you here, High Commissioner. Um, I'd like to start talking about um, you before we move on to talk about uh, Britain, the UK and Sri Lanka relations. Uh, you're no stranger to Sri Lanka. You visited Sri Lanka first when you were 18 years ago, 18 years uh, somewhere uh, in the 19... <laughs> I I'm not going to mention that. <laughs> Uh, let's yes, talk about indeed. your visit. No, I first came here when I was 18 in 1984, I'm happy to tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a visit that made a great impression on me. I was teaching English, English literature and English language in India at the time. And I came over from, the, uh, from India on the ferry. As a visitor? As a visitor. Okay. To, yes, so I came across to Manar and then travelled down on the train to Colombo. And I went to Kandy and Narelia and climbed Sigiriya. Uh, it was a visit which made uh, an impression partly because I was here so soon after the problems of 1983, and I saw Colombo at a time when it was still recovering. I saw other parts of the country which had also suffered in the, uh, in, in the Black July uh, riots. Right, but, but um, you took office as uh, High Commissioner in April 2015. I did, so I've been here for just over four years. But, but yes. uh, since you were 18 and then in 2015, from 1984 to 2015, I'm sh there has been a lot of development in, developments in Sri Lanka. Um, a crucial time for Sri Lanka, post-independence. We had riots and then a 30-year civil war. Towards the, towards the end of conflict, um, uh, this was you visit Sri Lanka again, but so much has changed. Yes, indeed. And Do I, you I see Sri Lanka as a, as a, as a, as a traveller or um, as, as, as a diplomat today? I think a nice, thing, a nice thing about my job is that it doesn't just involve travelling, it involves living in a country. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do see a big difference because when you live in a country you have friends and you can take part in local festivals. We've just had Vesak uh, just recently, of course. Uh, and you really get to, to know the country, you, you become part of it uh, mm -hmm. for a time and that is a great privilege and it's something I've enjoyed tremendously during my four years here. It's something I've enjoyed tremendously in all of the countries in which I have worked as a diplomat. But certainly you're right, you know, Sri Lanka has changed enormously since I was first here. I was back in 2004, 2005, mm -hmm. so during a time of, uh, of ceasefire, a relative calm, uh, when this country was again trying to find a way back to uh, normality. But even in my four years here, and you walk down Goldface Green today and it's hard to recognise or remember quite what Goldface Green looked like uh, just four years ago as you look at the buildings coming up. Uh, Britain has always had an interest in Sri Lanka from Ceylon to now. Uh, well, let's talk about Britain-Sri Lanka, UK-Sri Lanka relations. What do you want Sri Lanka uh, uh, in terms of uh, where do you see Sri Lanka going today in terms of good governance, uh, transparency in governance and in our investment and trade ties with the UK? I do think at a strategic level what we want for Sri Lanka is exactly what Sri Lankans want for Sri Lanka. Sri Lankans want a country that is prospering, a country that is at peace, um, a country where the rule of law prevails. Uh, and these are all things which are important for us in all of our friends. Because when the world is full of countries which are prosperous, are at peace, respecting the rule of law, the world is safer and more prosperous for all of us. So that objective is very much shared. But I should say how, how regularly I continue to be impressed, even after four years here, as I come across still more links between the UK and Sri Lanka. Uh, there are some which are obvious through English language or through cricket or through uh, the enormous diaspora. The, the people of Sri Lankans are first and second generation, third generation, who now live in the, in, live in the UK. Mm -hmm. But I keep coming across some smaller links um, as well, which help draw the peoples of our two countries together. I'll give you just one uh, example. I was uh, talking to Kumar Sangakkara just mm -hmm. a few days ago mm -hmm. uh, and he of course is about to become the first ever non-British president of MCC in well over 200 years, uh, which very is exciting for us and exciting yeah. for Sri Lanka and yes. cricket fans and Sri Lanka as well. Yes. We're very proud about that. <laughs> um, Hi Commissioner, um, the, the Easter Sunday attacks shook Sri Lanka and uh, you had to cut short your visit to church uh, on, on the 21st. Eight British nationals uh, were victims of the attacks 
And I think uh, this, this is uh, a uh, repetition of horrific incidents of uh, terrorist extremist activities happening across the globe and yes Sh Sri Lanka was taken by shock uh, in terms of you know um, an extremist group of such magnitude because Sri Lanka entered I'd say global terrorism a, f a new face for Sri Lanka uh, what are your thoughts about what we have done so far in the aftermath of these attacks um, in order to address the the uh, the situation that has arisen post attacks. Mm. I, I should start by saying how truly terrible the uh, attacks on Easter Sunday were, and you know our, our thoughts continue to go out to the many victims, the British victims, the hundreds of Sri Lankan victims um, of those atrocities. Um, I think we all admired the speed with which the emergency services got into action on Easter Sunday in the churches, uh, in the hotels that were attacked. Um, since then, um, from, what, from what I've seen, the, uh, the, the, the forces of law and order collectively have been doing a very thorough job um, at um, collecting up people who had ties to uh, the attackers, people who may have information and need to answer questions, because obviously a, a key for everybody, a key for people who live here, a key for people who are thinking of visiting, uh, is that greater confidence uh, that the sort of um, attack that we saw on Easter Sunday hopefully will never occur again uh, and if someone is uh, planning that sort of um, atrocity um, the hope that um, action will be able to be taken uh, beforehand. Um, it's nice to see the country beginning to get back to normal. It's clearly much more normal than it was immediately after the attack but also my sense is more normal and I hope I'm right to say this uh, than on, uh, on Monday uh, just last week mm -hmm. um, when we saw these um, extremely unpleasant, uncalled for uh, attacks on Muslim communities in some parts of the country which in themselves were extremely worrying uh, because as so many people have said uh, and we know it to ourselves from for example our experience in Northern Ireland after something like this it's really really important for communities to uh, come together to show each other the sensitivity and the affection that's needed uh, to knit people back together. Uh, the UK foiled 19 terror attacks within two years and uh, has been cracking down on those affiliated with the Islamic State. You have faced similar attacks back at home. What can we learn from the United Kingdom in terms of dealing with the, this mm. level of terrorism and extremism? Yes, we defeated 30 years after 30 years uh, a terrorist organization as a nation. But going forward, what are we? What should we know about uh, dealing with such extremism? We've all had to learn a lot from uh, attacks on us, uh, be we UK, Sri Lanka, so many other countries around the world, uh, by um, fundamentalist uh, extremists. Uh, and I think one important point to bear in mind is that the nature of a terrorist organisation like IS or AQ is that it is really quite different from uh, terrorist organisations in a more classical sense. Take the LTGE, it had really quite a conventional command structure, it had somebody at the top, it had uh, lieutenants and a system for, for giving orders. IS, uh, as we saw only a few weeks ago here in Sri Lanka, is much, much more nebulous. Uh, there is no same leadership exerting authority, giving over instructions about what uh, might be done where. Mm -hmm. And I think it's um, also important for us all to keep in mind that the sort of terrorism that we've seen here recently that you're referring to in the UK uh, is truly international in its dimension. Um, whatever the nature, and it's still becoming clear, but whatever the nature of the uh, connections between the attackers in Sri Lanka and people in other countries, mm -hmm. I think we can all be pretty certain that there are connections of some sort, uh, not least um, ideological. And, and to draw an analogy, it's a bit like having uh, a puzzle, uh, and we've all got different pieces of the puzzle. Um, it's only by, by uh, telling each other um, in the right circumstances which pieces of puzzle we've got that we can all begin to say, Ah, so this is what the puzzle looks like. So international cooperation is absolutely essential to uh, fighting this sort of international terrorism and preventing these sorts of attacks. Uh, are you saying, High Commissioner, that we must welcome uh, 
overseas intelligence officials in, in, in order to cooperate the fight against uh, terrorists? I think there are two challenges uh, with um, intelligence. Um, one is about um, well, there are a number of challenges, but one, one, channel, one challenge when you have the intelligence um, is how you bring it together, how you assess its value. And something, again, that uh, we've all had to learn to do is to bring together intelligence that comes to us through different sources. Mm -hmm. So here in Sri Lanka, we have military intelligence, you have your own SIS, you have police, uh, you have customs, you have uh, airport immigration. You have all kinds of people who might collect information which is more valuable when it's put together with information that other people have. So it's important to have in place um, a mechanism for bringing together information that's come from different sources, sitting down together and saying, right, um, what do we know about this? If we, what do we think it means? And in that case, what do we think we need to do about it? I think so that's the internal bit, the domestic bit. There's also the uh, changing um, international need and that comes back to my, uh, my point about the value that comes from nations judiciously sharing information with each other so that between them they can better understand the nature of the general and specific threats. Uh, Post-Easter attacks, uh, we, we saw um, Sri Lanka welcoming several investigators from overseas, uh, be it the United States, um, UK, but uh, what has the role been of your investigators and uh, how long are they, are they still in Sri Lanka or, and, and what has the progress of their work been? We brought in, um, yes, a number of uh, British experts uh, with different areas of expertise. To give you one example, uh, we had a team of 10 here from our Metropolitan Police Force, the London Police Force. Uh, they travel overseas whenever and wherever British nationals are the victims um, of terrorist attacks. Mm -hmm. So their specific uh, responsibilities were both to uh, look into the circumstances of their death, also, for example, to help with the repatriation to the UK of the bodies of British nationals who, who, who died on Easter Sunday. Right. Um, again, I'd, I'd like to ask you a little more about their work, uh, High Commissioner. Um, are, they, are they continuing to uh, engage in their investigations? Um, we had a large team here when, uh, in, in the week immediately after the attacks. Okay. Uh, we still have, I think it's now two uh, okay. members of the Metropolitan Police here, yes, who are continuing to work very closely uh, with uh, colleagues in the uh, Sri Lankan system here, particularly in Colombo. Uh, how do you respond to allegations that uh, foreign investigators, uh, they are a threat to Sri Lanka's sovereignty and national security, especially after several investigators, again from the Western world, were present in Sri Lanka? We had a lot of concerns raised about their presence, about the level of involvement and how that would actually infringe Sri Lanka's uh, sovereignty. Um, it's hard to answer the question without knowing precisely what the challenge is. Um, but I think in, in general terms, my answer goes back to the earlier point, which is uh, that terrorism these days is uh, an international threat. We all have different uh, experiences, different areas of expertise uh, that we can bring to bear. Uh, we are happy, and I speak not only for the UK, but for other countries too, uh, we are happy to share our expertise uh, where it contributes to building up the sort of capability uh, that will help, for example, friends in Sri Lanka um, deal with the immediate aftermath, but also uh, work out what to do to uh, develop their own uh, resistance, their own ability to resist, uh, respond to, identify, stop um, any future attack of this sort should somebody be thinking about it. So no, it's not about interference. Mm -hmm. um, experts, our experts very much come here with the intention of sharing and um, where, where, where they are welcomed, helping people to uh, develop uh, capabilities, Lear learning from us. We are equally happy, of course, to learn from, uh, from, from uh, the countries that we travel to. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the UK alone has faced several terror attacks uh, um, that was spearheaded by the Islamic State itself and l uh, connected militant groups. Uh, High Commissioner, what can we learn from UK? What should, what should our mechanism be right now? Do we need to set up an authority that looks into such, such the, the work of these uh, uh, extremist groups? Or what, what really has the United Kingdom done in this regard? I think part of it, and we've already talked about it, so I won't go into, into more detail, but part of it is about 
uh, developing the ability to find out about and stop mm -hmm. this sort of attack before it happens. I think there's another set of questions and we've had to ask ourselves uh, some very similar questions and the ans answers aren't easy um, around what it is or what it was that uh, led or uh, led the attackers to become the sort of people they were um, to put this uh, frankly evil intention into their heads mm -hmm. um, and to think, think about uh, what we need to be doing and who needs to be doing what to stop and to counter efforts to radicalise often young people. And I think answers quickly come back to the responsibility of communities, to the responsibility of uh, the people who live and work every day, family members um, of people who are at risk of being radicalised. Um, and we in the UK have learned just how important the roles, if we're talking about the Muslim community, um, but clearly uh, the problem isn't, isn't confined only to the Muslim community, but if we're talking about the Muslim community, it's the role of uh, religious teachers and leaders in mosques um, and, and other people in positions of authority, uh, what part they can play in, um, in preventing, preventing people from becoming radicalised and also where it's necessary in uh, efforts to de-radicalise people. De-radicalization and disengagement of youth. I think the UK, uh, at one point, we saw a lot of uh, youth being radicalized um, at several points in time. Uh, but uh, have you all taken any concrete measures that these uh, youth will not be engaged in the first place in, in such uh, ideological changes? There are clearly some steps that one can take to make, for example, access to the sort of material online which is going to uh, lead people to become radicalised or the, the purpose of the material is to radicalise people. There are steps that uh, one can take to limit uh, access to that sort of information. Uh, of course, you can't prevent people in a free society from doing certain things. Um, but I think the, you know, the aim of community programmes is very much to work with people to identify who might be, might, might be vulnerable um, and to work with them um, on a different set of values, for example, to um, identify what it is that makes them uh, vulnerable. Is it their employment or their family situation or a sense of uh, that you know, their talents aren't being valued, what it is, and then uh, work with them to um, address those issues so that the the draw of whatever um, extremist um, ideology is being promoted is less strong. Uh, would it be um, successful if the Muslim community got together to thwart these, uh, these incoming ideologies? Um, I do think that in every community, it, again it doesn't matter what community we're talking about, we might be talking about an extreme right-wing community, um, but in any community um, it is, uh, yes, the elders in that community, the other members of that community who necessarily have an important part to play. I'm um, certainly, I think, where we're talking about, for example, uh, groups who identify themselves either by their religion or by their faith. Uh, none of us likes to feel we have um, ideas, solutions, uh, instructions thrust upon us uh, by other people. So I think um, working to ensure that initiatives are felt to be community-led are felt to be owned by communities who in turn feel, that, feel responsible for and successful in taking action to address a problem in their community. I think that's a really helpful way to go. We were talking about post-attacks, um, what Sri Lanka needs to do and what lessons we can learn from the United Kingdom. Uh, I'd also like to talk a little about investor confidence. Um, Sri Lanka's confidence on Sri Lanka in terms of investment and trade uh, deteriorated post attacks uh, what what will you tell your investors your countrymen about sri lanka today um, just three weeks after the attacks thank you it's a good question i wouldn't say that um, investor confidence um, had deteriorated particularly i think um, the terrorist attacks the terrorist attacks like the ones that we saw on easter sunday uh, won't be first and foremost in their consideration perhaps it's useful to divide perceptions into into two different categories um, one is the perception of how safe it is to travel here um, and obviously the uk is 
uh, one of many, many countries which has travel advice in which we um, try to give our citizens um, advice that will help them to take decisions that will allow them to travel safely. Um, Sri Lanka is one of a large number of countries in the world where terrorism is an issue. The UK, of course, is another. Um, but for the moment, yes, uh, we are advising our uh, nationals against non-essential travel to Sri Lanka. It's some um, advice that I hope will be in a position to change soon. It's um, something we are keeping under very regular review, uh, and it's something that uh, my ministers are keen to change as soon as we feel uh, that we can responsibly do so. So that's the sort of perception on travel. I think on the investor side, uh, it's a different set of issues, and what attracts uh, investors uh, is certainty. Um, a, a confidence about what the environment that they're going to be putting money into is going to look like, not only now, uh, but in a few years' time as well. Mm -hmm. um, and issues around the ease of doing business. Um, Sri Lanka is not particularly well placed in the table that the World Bank puts together each year, which measures different countries' relative uh, standings, how easy they are to do business and issues like uh, bureaucracy, uh, customs duties, red tape, corruption, um, all come into that uh, evaluation. But I do think that these issues um, around the ease of doing business in Sri Lanka um, are ones which it's important to tackle. And some of them, some of them are quite easy wins. Um, as Sri Lanka security forces have beefed up uh, security and ensured and continued to say that Sri Lanka, that they're ensuring the security uh, in and around <coughs> uh, key areas and uh, for the general public, is there anything that uh, the UK is concerned about? Is that a threat to Sri Lanka? I think being realistic, there's always a threat to our countries. Um, terrorism of the sort we saw here on Easter Sunday terrorism of the sort that we've seen in London and in other British cities, other cities around Europe, um, is not something that we would be wise to say we have defeated. Uh, yes, we can, uh, we can deal with particular groups, but where we're talking more generically about the threat these days of fundamentalist terrorism, uh, then we are, we are not going to be in a position uh, to say that we have defeated it. What we can, of course, though, do, and this is, I think, what the public is looking to our governments to do, uh, is uh, give them well-founded assurances that um, as much as they can reasonably do is being done to keep people safe. Uh, and that goes back to the discussion uh, we were having earlier on about how do you collect, use, act on intelligence and other information in a timely fashion in order not to deal with attacks but to prevent attacks. Um, talking about in intelligence, there's something I'd like to highlight um, and uh, ask you, High Commissioner. Uh, soon after the attacks, we had in Sri Lanka a certain document that was uh, circulating on social media, which gave insights into intelligence information that was uh, already available in the country of uh, impending attacks. Um, India had warned Sri Lanka six months ago. and. Uh, is it safe to say that uh, other countries may also have known about such attacks, that, that there would have been an uh, intelligence, um, may, maybe hints about uh, attacks uh, that um, were focused on Sri Lanka? Um, I can't comment on specific information and I wouldn't want to um, comment on what information countries do or don't hold. Um, but I do think that um, certainly a country like mine, if it is um, aware of, the, uh, of, of a serious risk of attacks, um, takes action. Uh, in our travel advice, uh, we take on responsibility, as I said earlier, for um, giving advice to our nationals that uh, is intended to help them take decisions uh, that will keep them safe. Um, and where we are particularly concerned um, about attacks, uh, we say so. Uh, did the uh, UK have any intelligence information about uh, attacks that were, were targeting Sri Lanka? I can tell you I certainly was not aware, uh, absolutely not aware, that um, terrorists were plotting any sort of attack on Easter Sunday here. But was it very concerning for you when, when, uh, when there was uh, reports that emerged later on that there were intelligence information readily available here in Sri Lanka? I think there are uh, important questions, and they're clearly questions, the answers to which people are giving a lot of thought. 
uh, but certainly from which, uh, from what you've read, and I'm sure your viewers have read, and I have read uh, in the press. Um, yes, there are some um, concerning reports um, about um, whether or not action that should have been taken uh, was taken. But again, I don't think it's for me to comment on this while the questions are being asked and answers are being sought. Um, hi, Commissioner. I'd also like to uh, take your attention towards the UNHRC sessions. The core group on Sri Lanka presented uh, Resolution 40-L1 to the 40th regular session of the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council in Geneva on the 21st of March, um, one month uh, before the Easter Sunday attacks. Uh, of course, uh, the United States earlier left the United, uh, UNHRC calling it a cesspool of bias. But Britain continues to work with Sri Lanka in terms of uh, pressing Sri Lanka to go forward uh, on the recommendations and, and certain um, uh, measures that Sri Lanka has agreed with the, the, the Human Rights Council itself, uh, so is the United States. But what, what do you see uh, in terms of the progress Sri Lanka has made? Because this is the resolution that Sri Lanka continued to co-sponsor. There are people in Sri Lanka as elsewhere, of course, with lots of different uh, political agendas. So um, I read about the resolution uh, in many, many different ways. I've always been clear, and my uh, government has been clear, that uh, Sri Lanka's co-sponsorship of this resolution is commendable. Um, when I read through it, when I stand back and read through the resolution, and I'm not sure how many people who are listening will have done this, and I ask myself, is this, is this step in Sri Lanka's self-interest? Is this step in Sri Lanka's self-interest? Self-interest being the key word. I read through the whole resolution, and with almost everything in it, I say yes. This is the right thing for a country to be doing, which has experienced the horror of uh, internal conflict, and which is looking to take steps that will give it a much greater, more solidly founded guarantee of future peace and security. So rather than looking at uh, this, which is clearly how some people choose to describe it as something thrust upon Sri Lanka um, unwillingly, uh, I think it's much, much more constructive from everyone's perspective to think about this as a set of commitments entered into by uh, Sri Lanka for principled reasons um, with which uh, uh, with which the um, friends in the international community um, are committed to working with the country as we are doing to taking these steps forward. Uh, has Sri Lanka failed to show commitment in moving forward in any of these areas? Um, there are areas where a lot of progress has been made. Um, there are areas where some progress has been made and steps are in train to move things forwards. And there are one or two areas where uh, very little or no progress has been made. Um, so I think looking across the whole resolution, it's a resolution which contains um, quite a number of provisions, um, it gets a mixed report. Um, let's move on to talk a little about trade to uh, High Commissioner Sri Lanka uh, enjoys uh, a strong trade relationship with the UK. With the Brexit around the corner, uh, there is concern about whether Sri Lanka's trade will be uh, hit, whether this uh, uh, very prosperous trade relationship with the United Kingdom will be hurt in the process. Um, Brexit is clearly a, a topic which has generated, I don't know how many forests might have fallen for the amount of newspaper coverage it's got around the world. Um, it's, uh, uh, there are a set of Brexit questions which I simply can't answer, it's not I don't want to answer them, it's I can't, an can't answer them because none of us yet knows what the terms will be of the UK's exit from the European Union. Mm -hmm. Our Prime Minister has been very clear uh, that she is determined to lead uh, the UK through a successful exit. There are still various possible scenarios. Um, one option is a no deal, but the House of Commons has said that is not the way it wants to go. Uh, and then there are various um, options for uh, a possible deal between the e UK and the EU. Um, what we can do, though, is uh, say with confidence, because it's something within our control, uh, that the UK uh, now, and if anything even more so post-Brexit, uh, will be determined to develop um, its trading relationships and other relationships with countries 
all around the world. And clearly Sri Lanka, um, as a member of the Commonwealth, falls into a particularly special group of countries um, which have their own close set of values and associations. Is the United Kingdom worried or concerned about China's increased influence here in uh, the island? Um, we, we, of course, we, 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 wa we watch what China is doing with interest um, and what China is uh, doing as it grows, uh, as its economy grows, uh, in many countries uh, is important to us, not least in the UK, uh, where China is also a major investor. Um, I think we need to be quite realistic about this and um, we should all expect, it's not we can, we should expect that um, within the next um, few decades certainly the Chinese economy is set to become the largest economy in the world uh, and this will be quite a significant change. I think a challenge for China um, as its um, economy grows really remarkably quickly um, is um, understanding how it can best use the power, the political and other power that comes with that economic power in a way which works uh, for the good of everybody in the world. You know, we all have to live together on this, on, on this relatively small planet um, and uh, working together uh, with a rules-based system, uh, again, that delivers the sort of peace, uh, stability, growth that is in everyone's interests. Uh, is very much part of where I think the answer needs to be. Um, High Commissioner, before we talk more, we are uh, at the final stage of our discussion. Uh, I mentioned to our viewers that you're very passionate about environmental conservation and uh, you, you continue to share a lot of pictures, you know, of <laughs> birds and uh, you have been an enthusiastic bird watcher. Has this been since you were 18 when you uh, visited Sri Lanka or? Well, I think it's been, been uh, since before then. I've been an enthusiastic bird watcher since I was little. <laughs> uh, but um, no, bird watching first took me off to Ecuador a couple of times when I was at university. Uh, and I spent two whole summers working as a member of a conservation project mm -hmm. high in the uh, Andes, 4,000 metres up in the Andes, wow. uh, producing a plan to turn a forest into a nature reserve. Mm -hmm. Uh, but now here in Sri Lanka, I have large numbers of followers on Twitter, which is very nice. Um, but I try to use my bird photographs to encourage um, lots of people to take an interest in the natural world around them. Uh, um, I was going to say, um, we, we saw a report recently which came out which suggested that globally uh, one million species are at risk of extinction. Mm -hmm. And I think we all understand that that would be a quite extraordinary loss and do terrible damage to the planet that we live on. And we all have a part to play in, uh, in ensuring that the world around us is effectively protected. Uh, of forest dense, uh, we have areas in Sri Lanka where Pattu has been affected due to uh, deforestation. Uh, with your work, I'm sure uh, you, you try to work with the conservation, uh, conservation groups uh, in this regard. I take a keen personal interest in, uh, in forests and um, I do think that not only one of my favourite forests but perhaps the most important forest in Sri Lanka is Singharaja, uh, which is home to uh, not quite all but most of the endemic species of birds and many uh, endemic uh, reptiles and amphibians and fish uh, that uh, live there and almost nowhere else in the island but certainly no other country in the world. Um, it's an example of a, of a forest which is very special, uh, but which too is at risk from uh, logging and encroachment and human activity. Uh, the United uh, Kingdom and uh, your work here in Sri Lanka, we have, uh, we see uh, several projects that have been uh, launched by the, um, uh, the High Commission uh, in terms of improving social networks, uh, livelihood and uh, demining. How's the pro pro progress in terms of uh, demining here in uh, the north and east? We're proud of our demining uh, work. We've been contributing to demining work, including by two uh, British NGOs, um, MAG and uh, Halo Trust, um, to clear landmines in Sri Lanka. Uh, in fact, we recently um, secured additional funding to uh, give this, uh, this work one final push that we will hope will see Sri Lanka achieve its objective of becoming landmine free by 2020. That's just next year. Mm -hmm. um, Sri Lanka, at the end of the conflict, had some of the most heavily mined areas of the world, uh, which, was, which was extraordinary. 
Um, it's nice in part doing landmine clearing work here because new mines are not being laid mm -hmm. um, in so many parts of the world where this sort of work is being done. More mines are still being laid, but fortunately that is not the case here and the end is in sight and that will be a fantastic achievement for this country. Um, Hi, Commissioner. I think um, here, uh, as we talk about demining, and we, our thoughts also go back to the the very reasons that we had a conflict, and there have been several literature about uh, the lack of a common language uh, among communities, and certain scholars also say let's let's uh, bring out English as a link language. Uh, I believe uh, the British Council Council is working uh, on this. Um, it clearly helps um, that people can talk to each other. I'm not sure I'm the best person to um, suggest that all Sri Lankans should learn English. Um, it's sometimes a little controversial coming from me. Um, but what I do think is that English today, like it or not, but English today is a key to international um, success. It's a key, uh, particularly if you speak a language which uh, relatively few other people speak as your main language. It's a key to getting out there and being able to interact with, with the world, with the business world, with the world's literature, the world's film. Um, it really opens doors. Um, I like a quotation from, uh, from um, St. Augustine of Hippo from the 4th century, and he said, uh, the world is a book, and those who do not travel read only one page. Uh, and for me, it's, um, there's an analogy with, with language as well. Uh, because those who don't have an international language um, have trouble reading more than one page of uh, this extraordinary book out there. Um, I think English is tremendously important, and I think the government uh, is right to be uh, giving a high priority to this. I've spoken myself with uh, undergraduates uh, at universities in Sri Lanka um, who um, are learning studying in either Sinhala or Tamil, and whose English is not yet good enough um, to enable them to go out and compete for jobs uh, with employers who will be looking to them to have not only either Singular or Tamil, but also English. Uh, I think that's a significant setback for them. I think it would be really nice if every undergraduate going to university here could come out feeling assured that they will also leave uh, with uh, good English as well as with um, a degree in the studies of their choice. Mm -hmm. uh, Sri Lanka is also uh, talking about elections around the corner uh, and trying to understand whether we need an executive presidency or whether the executive should be with the parliament. Uh, let's talk about uh, work between uh, the cross-party select committees. The UK, how, w what can we learn from you? It's very interesting. Of course, our, our two parliaments have many um, traditions uh, in common um, and through the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, through the Westminster Foundation for Democracy, um, our parliamentarians work with counterparts in parliaments um, around the world, um, learning from them and sharing our ideas. Um, the idea of the cross-party select committee is a relatively recent uh, development in British politics. Uh, and we now attach high value to it. And it's this idea that the responsibility of a parliament um, is, amongst other things, to ask the executive, ask the government of the day, uh, questions on behalf of the people who voted them, the members of parliament, into office. Um, and to avoid this uh, becoming partisan along party political lines, uh, we have found that there is tremendous value that comes from having committees which look, for example, at health or foreign affairs or finance or education, whatever the topic is, um, but include members from all of the parties, or certainly all of the main parties in Parliament, who act together uh, as a responsible group of parliamentarians and put their party differences to one side and instead take on that separate responsibility for um, asking the government of the day questions in a way which uh, the intention behind it is to deliver good government and challenge government where things are not going well or perhaps things could be done differently or better. Are you concerned about, um, about how Sri Lanka could have free and fair elections in Sri Lanka or are, are you assured that Sri Lanka will continue to be able to have uh, independent elections freely and fairly? Um, I see no reason why Sri Lanka shouldn't be able to have um, free and fair elections. There are clearly some challenges on your sister. I think there are uh, some interesting issues around campaign financing, for example, in the Sri Lankan uh, system. Uh, you know, how is it that candidates are going to be funded to uh, fight campaigns um, which are often expensive, 
uh, but in, way, in ways which don't lead them uh, vulnerable to pressure if they're elected from interest groups which have supported them. And I think that sort of issue is tough. Um, but the basic principle um, I see here, uh, great value being attra attached by Sri Lankan voters to the idea that they should, uh, at periodic intervals, be able to choose who is going to govern their country. Uh, I'm looking at your uh, latest tweet. <laughs> you say, let's uh, get our children back to school. You're quoting a newspaper advertisement. I'd like to uh, end our program on that note. Uh, what's this tweet all about? Uh, are, you, are you referring to... Uh, what's happening in Sri Lanka. I was sitting, I'm reading the Sunday papers at home and I came across this full page advert uh, of a small girl holding her parent's hand and walking with a little rucksack on, on, on her way to school. Uh, and it was, a, it was a UNICEF advert saying, we need to get our children back to school. And I, was, I thought this is a message I can play a part in getting out. Uh, because I think, one, education is tremendously important. It is not something we can afford to deprive our children of. Um, second, of course, uh, having our children go to school is part of that crucial step of getting the, uh, the, getting the country feeling comfortable uh, with itself again after the terrible events of Easter Sunday. Uh, and the sooner the country can get better and every community uh, can uh, get, get back to feeling normal, uh, the better it will be for, for everyone. Thank you very much for your time here with us, uh, Your Excellency. Pleasure. Thank you for inviting me to join you. We had with us uh, uh, the British High Commissioner in Sri Lanka, James Dorries, joining us at Hyde Park on Other Terana 24. Thank you for watching. Good night.